<laughs> How about that? Fireworks. Wow. <laughs> Well, hello and welcome to another Sober Distancing episode of AA Beyond Belief. And uh, it's Friday. Happy Friday to everybody. And it is May Day. So happy May Day as well. And we have a special guest today, Angela and I. But before I introduce her, let's check in with Angela and see how she's doing. Angela, how are you? I am good. The, the Boise Satellite Office is uh, <laughs> is going strong today. So. You're up and running. Good deal. Up and running, yes. Back to the home studio. <laughs> yes. And we have a guest. She is Jackie S. And she is from Maryland. And I actually did a podcast interview with Jackie, oh, a couple of months ago, I think. And I had a screw up because I saved it on something that it doesn't work anymore. So anyway, we are going to redo it. And so this is the redo, and uh, the subject is going to be the power of pause, mindfulness in recovery. Jackie, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I just realized we're in three different time zones here, right? I'm in, <laughs> yeah. I'm in the Maryland studio. So <laughs> there you go. That's great. Yeah, this uh, it, we are also streaming in three different places, which is kind of wild. We're on uh, our Facebook group. We're in. YouTube and also on the AA Beyond Belief website, just for the the nerdy stuff that if you're interested in knowing all that. So exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I understand. I know that um, uh, you were going to be going to the International Conference of Secular AA that was going to be held in DC uh, this October. And of course, that isn't going to be happening. But you were planning on a presentation at the conference called uh, Power of the Pause, Mindfulness and Recovery. So I was hoping that you wouldn't mind just giving us a bit of that presentation uh, for maybe 20 minutes or so. And then we can start taking calls and uh, go from there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, please feel free. I have to say that uh, I love doing presentations. But the one thing I love about it is the interaction. So uh, John and Angela, you know, like, if I'm, you know, chime in, chime in and say, well, what's that? Or what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Because I I can't have the eye contact. So at least I'll get the voice contact. Yeah. Um, And uh, yeah, so I also want to let you you all know that um, I do this presentation or a similar one um, at an inpatient treatment center once a month. Um, And uh, it's, I'm very passionate about it. I think it can be incredibly helpful Um, And it just broadens the scope. This doesn't, I'm not trying to say that mindfulness or uh, a mindfulness way to recovery is, um, you know, different than the 12 steps. I mean, it is different, but it can be a supplement. Or if you're completely opposed to the 12 steps, it can be quite helpful, I think. So, um, So one of the things I like people to think about is what is mindfulness and what is mindlessness? You know, so mindlessness is pretty easy. We've all been there, especially if we are uh, recovering drug addicts or alcoholics, right? A lack of conscious intention to be mindless is to be oblivious, unaware. And the important thing about mindlessness, I think, is to understand that it leads one to do things automatically and you act without thought. And so if I was with you right now, I might reach out my hand to you and say, hey, I'm Jackie. And if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, you'd probably reach your hand out and shake my hand automatically, right? Right. Um, So that's just an automatic thing we do. It's pretty harmless, uh, again, if we weren't in the pandemic. Um, But if you're in active addiction and you set an intention to quit drinking or quit using drugs, And you go out and you see something that triggers you, whether it's an old friend who invites you to have a beer with them, or uh, you pull up at a gas station and your drug dealer's there, or you hear a song, right? And all of a sudden that just reminds you of something and it triggers you and you automatically use, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where mindfulness is the opposite of mindlessness, right? Mindfulness is this ability to 
be present in this moment and um, to be aware of your thoughts. And, but here's the trick though, and we'll, we'll, I'll talk about this, but it's to be aware of your thoughts without getting too attached to them. And oh, it's thoughts and or feelings because um, if let's say I'm trying to get sober and um, I go into a meeting and I see my, my ex there, right? So my thought or my feeling might be, oh, F it, you know, I'm trying right. to do the right thing and here are my exes. And so I want to hightail it out of there. But if I'm mindful, if I have cultivated or am beginning to cultivate a pause button, I can hit the pause button. I can maybe see if there's somebody else in the meeting that I can talk to about the way I'm feeling. I can find another meeting. Um, yeah, there was, a, there was a joke when I was first getting sober that said, um, well, it might have been way before that, but I heard it when I was first getting sober that said, if you go into a bar and you don't like the bartender, you don't quit drinking, you find another bar. You know, right. so it's the same thing. You go to a meeting, you see your ex, go to another meeting. Um, and so, so yeah, so mindfulness is just, uh, it's really cultivating that pause button, the power of the pause. Mm -hmm. um, does that all make sense so far? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. It does. I, you know, the only thing, um, the only time I've ever come close to something like this, I suppose, was that there was a period of time when I was meditating. I think I was sharing this with you before. And uh, during that time, I learned that um, when I was meditating, I kind of let my thoughts kind of go by and try not to grab onto them. Mm -hmm. And I learned that I could do that when I wasn't meditating too. So if I was at work or something and I had some sort of a negative thought, I didn't really have to grab onto it. I could just kind of let it go. But boy, it took a lot of practice. And when I was practicing it and aware of it, it seemed like I was, you know, I was kind of used to doing that. And it was very, very helpful. And I think that's, would you think that would be mindfulness? Is that Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah ab absolutely. And a lot of people would say that um, mindfulness and meditation do go hand in hand. And, and, and we'll talk about that for sure. Um, but I don't know that it's the only time you can be mindful is on the cushion or, or on, mm -hmm. in your chair or however you're you're practicing mindfulness, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it really is, you know, simply just understanding that your thoughts and your feelings don't have to control you. Right. Um, that you could just, you could just be there with whatever your thoughts and feelings are without having to react to them. Right. How, how do you think, how, how's that sound? <laughs> Eat, <laughs> right. <laughs> I think it, it sounds really hard, I think, for a yeah. lot of people, right? And uh, yeah. and, and I think for some reason, uh, I'm, there's probably some research about this, but um, uh, maybe you guys even know, but for some reason, when we're in early recovery or at the end of our using, um, it doesn't seem like we have the ability to right-size our thoughts and our feelings, right? Everything seems to be an emergency. Um, yeah. Would you agree, Angela? Oh, definitely. I mean, everything's a big deal. So I know in my early recovery, um, my <laughs> my sponsor um, had made a deal with me that I wasn't allowed to quit another job or um, end another relationship without calling her first. Because <laughs> any time at work, somebody said anything to me that sounded at least, you know, in the very least critical, um, I would lose it and um, and quit. Um, you know, because how dare they treat me that way? And right. um, and same, you know, with relationships, I couldn't couldn't do those either very well because you know lots of things trigger you in relationships. So um, so yeah, so that was how I first started learning to pause <laughs> was to was to actually just call my sponsor when I was upset um, before I did anything. And uh, yeah, that was my version of it. Early on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, I mean, I think it would be nice to reach guru status, which I have not done, <laughs> uh, where we can just like pause and, and the feelings just melt out of our body magically. <laughs> but I don't think there's anything wrong with pausing and realizing if I don't call a trusted friend or sponsor um, that I might, you know, I don't know, hit somebody <laughs> or whatever, quit my job or, you know, get yeah. out of this relationship. So there's, there's, um, there is this, this way that one can cultivate, I think, enough mm, peace or mindfulness to sit through feelings, 
But mm -hmm. I don't, I probably wouldn't suggest that to someone in early recovery or, or even someone who's just struggling, like right now in this pandemic, right? Just mm -hmm. to be mindful and let things kind of roll off of us. I mean, I'm sure that there's some people that can do that easier than others. But I think for most of us, especially those of us who find solace in a, a group of sober folks, you know, that, mm -hmm. that we need that. We need to get into that Zoom meeting or call someone when we're feeling a little squirrely. Um, yeah, definitely. It, it kind of reminds me of people are in early recovery, a lot of the meetings where, you know, they said they just uh, give it to God. <laughs> and, right. And, you know, and I was like, well, one, you know, I, I don't have that kind of a higher power, but also, you know, how is that useful to me right now? And, and so, yeah. Yeah, I used to feel like there was really something wrong with me because people would talk about, you know, I just prayed about it and this was removed and that was relieved. And that was just never my um, process. And when I did believe in God, I kind of thought that God must not like me as much as right. God likes those other people because my process was usually long and hard and often dark. Um and it, I would get through it. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't pick up a, a drink or a drug, but it wasn't, it wasn't magical. And so See, that's how I felt too. But I, I felt like there, there was something wrong with me because I, I didn't have the ability to believe in God or make God work the way that other people could. Um, and it, it took me a long time to kind of understand that it wasn't that I didn't under that I didn't know how to use God. It was that there wasn't actually no God. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And I still, you know, I mean, I still can, um, I still can get kind of, uh, I wouldn't say jealous exactly, maybe envious of people who it just seems so easy. Like mm. I think I, I've, you know, I have gray hair. I think I've aged enough now to know that it's mm, nobody. It's not easy for anybody. None of no. this is easy. Life is difficult. You know. And, um, and if we're lucky to have some of these principles, both, you know, I, I love the principles of the 12 steps and, and I love these, these mindful principles. Um, so, so you guys help me out here because normally what I will ask people is to think about what they do mindfully and what they do mindlessly. Can you guys think of anything Ooh. you might do mindfully? Um, mindfully. Well, um, when I get into something I enjoy, like, um, cookie decorating, I do that mindfully and can do that for many hours and, um, and, you know, kind of like in the zone type of thing. Um, so I think I do that nice. mindfully. I'm very deliberate and, you know, present with the cookie and the cookie decorating, you know, stuff. Yeah, that's and, awesome. uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of a thing. Um, so, yeah. How about, How about you, John? John? Do you have anything mindfully? Well, what, what I would do mindlessly is maybe react in traffic. Mm. You know, somebody I, <laughs> makes me angry because of the way they're driving or some stupid thing like that. You know, that's pretty, that's pretty mindless. Yeah. Or even this, <clears throat> I might be at work and I guess this might count as being mindless. I make a mistake and I just won't get over it. I just, uh, you know, I just beat myself up over that mistake that I made. And I just, it can, can sometimes just ruin my day. Um, but what I do mindfully, um, it's interesting, kind of like what Angela said, things that I really enjoy, like if I'm ed editing a podcast or, you know, talking to somebody in a podcast, listening to somebody um, that I, I'm pretty mindful about that. Um, I would also think that um just sometimes at work um i will i before i'm a manager so before i speak with an employee i try to be very careful about um how that employee feels and um oh the the, the entire situation you know mm -hmm. what it, depending on what we're going to be talking about Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Because I mean, you can see how that's so helpful, right? If we can just take a pause, take a breath. Um, I'm a mental health therapist. When I first started practicing, I mean, I really had to take some time before every patient came in to just center myself and try to be present. And now, of course, it's more of a habit. Uh, I still am present. I'm, I, I do think that is one of the things I do mindfully is, is work with patients, mm. um, which is also why I don't like the Zoom because it, it takes something out of that, you know, the way, the way I'm doing it now. But, yeah. um, 
But the thing I do mindlessly the most, which is so scary, and thank goodness you guys don't live in proximity to me, is drive. Yeah. I am completely mindless when I'm driving. It's pretty scary. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just am. I mean, not always. I mean, I've gotten better, but I do think it is the one thing where like my husband will be like in the car with me and he's like, can you just drive? <laughs> can you just yeah. drive, like put your phone down, stop doing this, stop, you know, yeah, it's, um, so this practice will benefit everyone on the road as the, the better yeah. that I practice mindfulness, everyone will be a little safer. Um, yeah, so I mean, and, and you know, John, when, when you were talking about uh, not letting it go when you make a mistake, you know, that's the one definition is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given time without getting carried away by it, mm -hmm. right? So just understanding I made a mistake. Oh, look at this. I'm actually angry with myself. Wow, I wonder if I could just put that anger down, right? And, and that's the thing. I think mindfulness should always be um, gotten into with a, a sense of non-judgment, right? Like, feelings are neither good nor bad. They just are. Circumstances are neither good nor bad. They just are. Now, I know that sounds really woo-woo and I'm totally a human being and can complain about things. But if if I go into it with that kind of intention, then I, I don't get as carried away if that makes sense, you know? Right. Um, you know, I've had, uh, I had a run of tragedies in my recovery, lots and lots of death. Um, and to be honest, like, I don't, I, I wish I hadn't had to do that. I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, wow, that was really good or whatever, but it does make me more mindful about life, more mindful how quickly death can come. Um, I think it makes me a person that when someone is experiencing death, they can call me because I'm, I'm more, I'm just more grounded about it. Like, yeah, that's horrible. People do die, you know? Um, and in fact, I remember talking to my sponsor when my sister was terminally ill and saying, and crying on the phone and saying, I'm just afraid she's going to die. And my sponsor and her mindful Buddhist wisdom said, well, she will die, <laughs> you know, like, and it just, it really helped to hear that. Like we're all going to die. So, you know, um, that's really interesting that about grief. Um, I went through uh, my father's death uh, after about 10 years of sobriety and I remember going into it because my mother had died when I was before I got sober. And so I, I experienced grief um, through drinking. And right. that was I know what that was like. So now I'm going to experience grief as a sober person. And I and I've been sober for 10 years. And I'm thinking, oh, I, I can handle this. I can oh. handle this. I can handle this grief. But what I noticed was I couldn't and I was crazy. And it was like the grief sometimes would just flow over you, you know, just flow over me. And mm -hmm. I, I, I just couldn't control it. Um, and I guess what I learned from that experience is, and this is what I always um, try to relate with people that might be experiencing grief, is I t always share that story with them that, you know what, I really learned I really couldn't control it, that it was almost like nature was taking its course and it would just bring this grief on in waves and little by little, it would almost, in a way, heal me, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I love that analogy. Because then I think the more, and I think this is the point I was trying to make, is that if once those deaths happened, uh, I realized I really am not in control. Yeah. And not just of life or death, but really anything, you know? Yeah. And it's also why everybody's a little freaked out about this pandemic. I think the main thing for most of us, I mean, I feel lucky that I don't know a ton of people affected by the actual virus, right? Sick. Right. Um, but yet, and even people I know who aren't affected, they're still completely stressed out. And it's the unknowing. It's the feeling out of control. And so mindfulness, if you start practicing it, can really help you kind of get comfortable with being out of control or just being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I mean, I think that's the caveat here. It's not mindfulness doesn't make you happy, right. joyous or free. Well, it does kind of make you free, um, but it will make you more content, right? Like when people die, you, you grieve, but if you don't try to fight the grief, if you just are content, like, well, this makes sense. It would be weird if I wasn't crying or if I wasn't sad or, um, you know, that's where mindfulness can really help you don't not to fight it. Yeah. You know, about the the pandemic, too. I don't often think about how it's making me feel. 
Um, occasionally I might talk to somebody at work about it that it seems like, and I was sharing this with you earlier, that the days seem to be kind of monotonous where one day is like the other, the next day. But I know there's a lot more going on. Um, I noticed that my sleep is disturbed and I was reading in the paper that that seems to be common right now that people, um, aren't sleeping really well. So there's a lot of, there's probably a lot of stress that's going on that I'm really not that mindful about. That's Mm -hmm. just, that's just, I'm just somehow, I don't know, muddling through. Right, right. A little Probably bit of meditation like in the morning might help you, John. Yeah. <laughs> Not trying to force feed you <laughs> meditation or anything, but uh, it is amazing, though. If like if you can just sit for a few minutes and watch your mind, you can be like, oh, right, yeah, I am kind of stressed. That. Oh, it does help. You know, now that we're working from home too. Um, so I can, I'm starting work a lot earlier. And so I'd start work almost as soon as I possibly can, you know, 630 or seven o'clock. And my I normally wouldn't start till eight or 830. So uh, I am now beginning to take a little bit of time not to just jump right into it and just kind of sit and have some coffee and, you know, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then back to kind of the like how mindfulness and, uh, you know, recovery from addiction goes hand in hand. You know, I think that most of us in active addiction, um, we we liked not being present. Right. It was hard to be present when and I'm just an overarching stereotype when I was <laughs> lying stealing and cheating, right? I didn't want to be present. I wanted, I mean, in fact, I I would say that the main reason I used drugs was because um, I didn't want to be present, right? I hated the way I felt. And and I was one of those alcoholic drug addicts who, um, I didn't have a lot of euphoria in the last, you know, I don't know, 15 years of my using. I used in order to not feel so bad, Right. So it was like I felt a little less worse. And um, and so when I got sober, I had to figure out how to, um, I don't know, right size my feelings like we were talking about. Right. Like because I really believe it's the feelings that are going to make us relapse, not the circumstance. It's the feeling around the circumstance. Right. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That and makes so, sense. yeah. And so I'm sure you've heard this in some way or another, like. The stimulus comes at us, right? Somebody dies, our shoestring breaks. Um, it could be, li- I mean, I'm telling you, the closest I ever got to relapse, well, not ever, ever, but I, in the first 15 years of my recovery was when it was in December. I'll never forget. I was trying to get out the door to go to a meeting and a sho- my shoestring broke. And I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get drunk, you know, at my shoestring. I was going to show that shoestring to his <laughs> boss. And it was, right. but it was such a wake up call, you know, and, uh, and, and I needed to kind of look like, you know, like you were saying, John, look at what's really going on. What am I so stressed about? You know, um, and then, you know, turn to the steps, turn to sponsorship to try to alleviate some of that underlying pain. Um, yeah. That's one. That's something I did learn, I guess, through the steps. Is if I was angry, <clears throat> feeling angry, there was usually really something else going on. I was like either I was afraid of something, or it was usually kind of like depression masked as anger. Mm-hmm. Um, anger could really be like um, a way of um, gauging that there's something wrong with me. You know, right? There's yeah. something wrong that I need to pay attention to. Yeah, mine was always, or mine usually is, is a fear, and it doesn't look that way at first, but it's generally uh, fear. Um, so I get angry and, uh, because I'm afraid of embarrassment. So if somebody thinks I'm wrong, then I'm embarrassed about that. And, and so that's a, that leads back to fear. So, yeah. yeah. Same. I, I can relate to that. Yeah. For me, a lot of times it's fear, but it really gets masked as anger or just like mm, passion or excitement. Like if I just right. get, get too, too high almost, you know, like, blah, 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 blah. it's like, what's going on, you know? I'm kind of trying to run away from my feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, so we get, so the stimulus comes at us and then we respond to the stimulus, but between the stimulus and our response is a pause, right? And uh, if I was in front of you now, I have this slide that shows this, it's really nice. And, um, (laughs) but in, in, when it says pause in the middle, I also have the word pray because this is where I can really um, help the folks, if I'm, if I'm doing this presentation in a treatment center who don't believe in God, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times what'll happen, the stimulus will come to us and we're in a 12 step program and we call our sponsor and they say, pray about it, right? Well, for a lot of people that works, but if you don't believe in God, you're, what are you left with? I say you're left with a pause, 
Yeah. Right. Because if you, that's all praying is anyway, is stopping for a few minutes, pausing, asking for help, you know, asking the universe for help. And um, I've said this before on this, uh, on this Friday night call in show. Um, Angela was so helpful when I heard her uh, share her experience as being an atheist in AA saying what she does is listen for the action after the pray about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pray about it, but then what? right? Like what's, yeah. what, how are you going to interrupt those feelings? Um, so yeah, so that's really, this is in a nutshell, what mindfulness is. It's cultivating the pause between the stimulus and our response to it. Um, because as much as I want to say, yes, on a, on a good day, when I'm on the, the, the good beam, you know, everything is, is right with me and the, the universe. Um, I might have a feeling like, uh, Oh gosh, my my colleague at work didn't mention uh, about the group experience. I wonder if he thinks I'm making a mistake, right? I might I might have all those thoughts in my head that that aren't really rational. They're just old parts of myself that are don't feel like enough. Okay, so if that happens on a good day, then I can say, "Wow, that's that's really old stuff. You just need to let that go, and that's it. Boom, mm -hmm. a second. But if it's a bad day, I can do the exact same thing because I'm mindful, but it doesn't mean the elephant on my chest always goes away right away. And it's just learning how to let the elephant just be there. Like, okay, you're really feeling anxious about this. And, um, and then, you know, if it doesn't pass uh, and I'm uncomfortable, then I do have a toolbox full of call somebody, sit in meditation, get outside in nature, you know, like there's lots of other things I can do. But the first thing is to pause. I was wondering, Gail, if there's like, I don't know, not Gail, but <laughs> Gail. <laughs> Excuse me, Jackie. Okay. Is there like, uh, is there some sort of trick or something that 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 you can use to remind yourself to pause? You know, or yeah, is it's it just called a matter practice. Of just trying practicing it. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, I just think it's practicing, and I do think that's where the meditation piece comes in. And gosh, we live in a world now. When did I? I was talking to my friend Michelle today because she and I kind of started meditating together, and I think it was like two thousand five. Uh, yeah, around 2005. And I got sober in 1989. Um, and it was pretty torturous for me at the beginning. But people that I was really admired were doing it. And I liked the results they were getting, right. And so it's kind of like when you come into AA, right, we want what these other people have more or less. So we do what they do. Um, and so what happened was I would sit in meditation, and I would think that everybody else was blissed out and peaceful. And I was just kept thinking, I wonder how many minutes it's been. Should I open my eyes? Should I look at my watch? You know, <laughs> my butt hurts. <laughs> yeah. I fell asleep. Oh, I wish I had put socks on, right? Whatever. Um, but in doing that, and just not getting up and running out of the room, I learned to be mindful. I learned to watch my mind, watch how it was trying to seduce me, watch how my feel what my feelings were saying, and sit there anyway. You know, and so I, I, I'm not saying, and you know, I'm not saying you have to like, you know, meditate for 45 minutes every day. John Kabat-Zinn would say you should, um, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that, but I can't, I just can't do that. Um, when I first started meditating, I would in the mornings get up before any of my kids got up or my husband and I'd put the coffee on and while the coffee pot was filling up and I could hear it dripping, I would sit. And that was all I could do. And that was probably five minutes, you know. Um, but it was amazing if I missed that, you know, like it didn't guarantee that I was going to have a great day. But if I didn't do it, whatever the bad day was would be worse, you know, if I didn't just give myself that minute. Um, so I'm encouraging people to call. I've okay, got good. the sign up there for to call us. You can call in at 844-899-8278, and uh, we would love to hear from you. Call in with any questions you might have about uh, mindfulness and the pause or anything else you might want to uh, chat about. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll take a little while for people to call if they do call. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, one of the, the things I love is that your mind is out to get you right? I mean, yeah. all of us, not just me, not just you guys, uh, all of us. And so what uh, mindfulness practice does do is it, it tames the amygdala, the brain in the front, uh, where the fight or flight response uh, gets triggered and tickled. And so um, you can learn that no matter what happens, there's always a pause. Uh, well, 
I mean, if I'm having a heart attack, please use CPR. <laughs> don't pause. <laughs> if there's a lion chasing you. But I mean, the times that we don't need to pause are so few, you know. So um, Patrick Greer has an interesting comment. Um, okay. He says that meditation seems stereotyped as pushing thoughts slash stimuli away. I wonder if the word pause may contribute to that. Mm. Maybe for us disassociators, mindfulness involves unmuting, unpausing, and little spurts. Interesting. I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I, I get what um, what I think he, he's saying um, because I've I've listened to uh, some you know talks. There's lots of talks on mindfulness <laughs> and, and stuff, um, and on meditation. And um, and I know for me, I uh, to do actual meditation, I have to have the guided meditation because my my uh, mind just you know does not like to stay put for for long periods of time. You know, like five seconds. That's way too long. Um, right. And so I was looking at some things um, and uh, and found in different types of dance um, that people were talking about the difference between like yoga and uh, say Nia, a different form of, you know, kind of dance. Um, and that with mm -hmm. the Nia, it's like you're doing the pause, um, but you're moving it through your body. Um, and so you, you're you aware of it, you're not pushing it away, you're, you're considering it, you're just not dwelling on it. And so, you know, that's what the, the comment that uh, we got uh, brought to mind for me is that um, I find in my pause that that is what I'm doing um, because I, I do have a past um, with trauma and dissociation is um, is quite easy for me. Um, and so when I pause, um, usually that is um, not to push away the idea, it's to examine the idea and not act on it um, immediately. That's my big thing because even dissociating is acting on it. Absolutely. So if I have the, the um, ability to pause whenever I'm having a, a a feeling, an unpleasant feeling that I might act on, then I fe feel like that that's, you know, a, uh, a positive thing for me, you know, even if I do still decide to act on it. <laughs> um, but I don't, um, I don't tend to, to, you know, push it away. So I guess maybe in, in recovery terms, it is kind of like the difference between, um, between praying and then letting go, letting God, or um, pausing when agitated and doubtful mm -hmm. and, um, you know, discernment, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, there is some uh, clinical study with, uh, in, with therapists and psychologists that if someone is really good at dissociating, yeah, they love meditation and you really got to, you know, check them like what's going on there. You know, you know it seems, that seems to be really easy for you, but I never think meditation is about clearing my mind, mm -hmm. stopping my thoughts. It's about getting to know my mind, getting to understand my thoughts, get it. And, and so when I, especially when I teach folks new in recovery, you know, we're talking two, three days in sometimes uh, I, I'll give them uh, I'll say, okay, we're going to do this meditation. And if you want to be here, if you want to be present, just focus on your breath. If you keep focus, uh, breathing in, I know I'm breathing in, breathing out, I know I'm breathing out, you're going to be present. But if you can, if you have the ability, just watch your mind and watch your thoughts. But for yep. some people, that can be dangerous because they get re-traumatized that early mm. in recovery. And so mm -hmm. I say, if, you're, if your mind is taking you into the past and you're feeling a lot of fear and guilt, then just focus on your breath and then you'll be here. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. That makes a lot of sense. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, I do agree with him. And I agree with you too, that um, meditation isn't about eliminating my thoughts. In fact, I, I would use my thoughts. That was my whole purpose of meditating was to learn how not to act, act on my thoughts, to exactly. let them just kind of go away, you know, like a cloud in the sky, just let it drift away. Because nice. the mind produces thoughts. Yes. Oh, Geostube wants to know what the phone number is. The phone <laughs> number is 844-899-8278. And I will put it up here on the deal here. Remove, remove the um, Gail's comment. Gail also had a comment though. She wanted to know, is there such a thing as sitting in your thoughts too much? She says, I have some epic dueling matches with my wall and overall, I don't know if it's helped me. How can I tell? She wants to know. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, I love that because I think I can get there too where, and, and I'll talk sometimes in my darkest hours, right? Like in the grief, right? I'm sitting there, I'm having all these feelings, I'm sad, 
um, w- what do I do? Do I, I mean, I, cause I'm thinking, well, you should just be here. You should work through it, right? Get it all out. But no, I mean, sometimes I just have to go for a walk, call somebody. Right. And so, uh, I mean, Gail might not be thinking of something quite that intense, but, um, yeah, it could be that, that thing at work or that, uh, you know, oh my gosh, a, a couple months ago I was in court and, uh, it was a family matter an orphans court. And I, uh, got kind of triggered, you know, <laughs> I'm a very mindful, nice person, but, uh, somebody said something that, uh, kind of, uh, went against my character, kind uh, you know, said something bad about me and, I muttered a profanity under my breath and the judge asked me to leave the courtroom, right? Well, that really triggered, like, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm 30 years sober. I'm 56 years old. What, how could I have gotten kicked? How could I have done something like that? You know, and, and so I had to take action. I couldn't just sit with that. And so basically I wrote a letter apologizing to the judge, but anyway, I'm, yeah. So we, I could have thought about that too much and I could have called 50 million friends and um, yeah. So sometimes it can be too much. Uh, ruminating you're not gonna believe this. We have three callers. Oh my gosh! Okay, <laughs> three Thanks. people. Yeah, we have okay. three people calling right. at one time. Okay, so we're gonna <laughs> let's take this first call here. Okay. Oh boy! So the other ones are gonna have to wait. Hello, <laughs> who's there? Hello. Okay. Uh, you might have to. I might have to let him go or her go. Okay. And we'll take the next caller. Hello. Hi, this is Sam from Lawrence. Oh, Sam, how are you? Hey, good. How are you? I'm doing great. So nice to hear from you. Uh, yeah. Um, so I just was calling because um, my home group in Lawrence was um, an agnostic meditation group. Um, so that's kind of how I got into AA. And um, I just think that the top, you know, mindfulness and meditation just fits perfectly with alcoholism and recovery um, because so much of my alcoholism was just like being on autopilot and always just trying to change how I felt about things, um, especially if I was having negative feelings, just kind of running away from that. And uh, so mindfulness meditation um, has me practice just being aware instead of being on autopilot. And um, being okay with like being uncomfortable, having uncomfortable feelings and just sitting with them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, um, and now I teach, um, I teach high school and I have been reading a lot of studies about how great mindfulness meditation is in schools and it's becoming really popular um, in the school system. So I've been trying to um, pilot a little program for kids to learn how to do that. And um, so far they really like it. So I'm I'm hoping we can keep it going. You know, there's a great book. I taught some high schoolers uh, meditation. It's called learning to breathe. And it's like meditation for adolescents. And it's, um, it's great. It's like an eight week course. I mean, you're probably doing fine. But if you ever wanted any supplemental materials, that's a really good book. And it even comes with some meditations that you can um, download onto your computer. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no worries. All right, well, yeah, great episode, and I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. calling, Sam. Nice Thanks, to hear from Sam. you. And Sam. Right. bye <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> Sam. Sam is so nice, and she is actually um, a new patron, and I appreciate that so much. Uh, oh, she nice. signed up to give a dollar a month, and I tell you what, mm-hmm. I like that. If, if, if a lot of people gave a dollar a month, it would help us out a lot. Anyway, got another call coming in from area code 714. Mm. We'll take this one. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm George from Mary Coach 714. Hi. Hi. I love the podcast. <laughs> I, oh, I've been listening for years, and I just discovered the podcast, and now it's on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, mindfulness and meditation um, and sobriety also. Um, 32 and a half years sober. Um, still go to meetings, um, not that frequently in um the coronavirus thing. We have um, some Zoom meetings. They're all, they're none of them um, <laughs> secular meetings. Um, and when they start the uh, Lord's Prayer, I get up and leave, usually right before <laughs> yeah. that. It's not, <laughs> it has never been part of my recovery. My first sponsor, uh, who detested the word sponsorship, he was a 
very old fashioned big book guy. He said, well, I'll just be your friend. Mm. It was very, uh, although, uh, a, uh, a seven day a week, uh, Catholic, um, never mentioned a thing about church or religion. He said, you can be whatever you want. He's mm. very wide open, old time, big book guy. Um, not a lot of emphasis on the steps, not a lot of emphasis on uh, the, the complexity of the steps, you know. It started out 3, 6, 12, whatever, um, and traditions. He said that's all very well and good, but, you know, sobriety is two alcoholics sitting across from each other talking about life. and That really helped me a lot. So I didn't feel that I was ever constrained to have to have a higher power in a meetings. I, I've been an atheist since I was 13. I've been confirmed in the Episcopal Church, and Dad said, you want to go? I said, no. I don't really believe it. So <laughs> I, I never went, and uh, I've just, I've learned how to adapt to people uh, with my atheism. I don't make it, I'm, I don't I don't walk down the street with a banner, I'm an atheist and I'm sober. Um, I just live my life. Um Many friends in sobriety, uh, ranging from atheistic like me, atheist agnostic, to uh, very devout religious people. And I, I take them at face value as humans. And I just suspend my disbelief that they all know I'm going to hell. You know? <laughs> 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 that's <laughs> I great. Just forget it. That's just, that's just an aberration because they're going to die and they won't believe that, right? <laughs> um, so the thing about... <laughs> the the, the thing about meditation is so important for me. I started in 75. I, I remember, I just like I remember my first day of sobriety. I remember my first day in, in the TM program, and I kept a very simple program. I did not get into any of the fancy, elaborate rituals and so forth. I had a very good teacher. He said, stick with the basics. Stick with the basics. And I... Meditate twice a day for 30 minutes each time. Wow. And I don't think about anything. I don't think. I don't have to think. I don't have to worry about the time. I don't have to keep thoughts out of my head. The TM mm. method is let it go. Mm. Let it go, let it go, let it go. And pretty soon all the thoughts disappear. And in half an hour, my little uh, buzzer reminds me that it's time to slowly open my eyes and get back in the world. And it's been immense, immense help to me. It's the first thing I do every morning. And at the end of my day, it's the first thing I do before I do anything else. So have you everything been doing that, George? Cons- have you been doing that ever since 1975? 1975. Wow. June 21st. Wow. wow. That's amazing. 1975. I've, I've forgotten my, the late, my teacher's name. She's just wonderful, charming. I was her first initiate. And she was so nervous. <laughs> I remember how nervous she was. But uh, it was just a wonderful experience. Uh, Occasionally, once every couple of years, I go in for a checkup. I just sit around with a bunch of other meditators and sit there, and we kind of bliss out for half an hour. And people ask me, what is it like? I said, I don't know. It's not meditation itself. It's how I feel afterwards that makes it so important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I have that mindfulness is, follows the meditation. Absolutely. So I dive into, I dive into, mindf- you know, into my meditation and I come out and I have mindfulness. Is all I meditation also have days where they, is that what all meditation all leads medita- to? Does all meditation lead to mindfulness? Uh, Always. Hmm. For me, I'm for you. My own experience. It, I, I I don't have any theoretical background. Yeah. You know, people ask me, "What's what's what's the theory behind being an atheist?" Simple question. Do you believe in God? You believe in God? No. Okay. Fine. You know, yeah. people talk about advanced atheism, and I think that is so much malarkey, jump, hokum, <laughs> and BS. You know, I just, I, I, I just turn my back. I walk away. It is so simple. So I'm not here proselytizing um, meditation, but that is how I get through my, I get to my mindfulness. Mm. Um, and it was really helpful for me when my wife died in uh, February of uh, 17, and I was going nuts. Um, I thought of, I had suicidal thoughts. I thought about drinking and called a friend. No, oh, George, what's on your mind? Why are you thinking about drinking? And two hours later, I wasn't. Um, what helped me was to be able to get in a, uh, a grief therapy group. And I walked in and the lady who walked in as a group said, anybody new here? And I raised my hand. 
And I said, this, I, this, I'm George. My wife died. I'm going crazy. I have this, that, that, you know, look for five minutes in the same world. And she asked, does anybody else feel that way? And everybody in the room raised their hand. Nice. So I was able to put myself into a recovery place of mind. And that was three years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I've, it's being mindful and aware. And it was like AA meetings. No, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. But I get up and I go every week. And every morning, because I start my day with meditation, she recommended we de- dive deeply into our pain and our grief. And feel it, feel it, feel it. Be mindful of the pain and grief that you're in. Don't try to evade it. So that was part of my meditation in the morning. So I never had a problem with it. And it, it hurt. It was painful. We met and married in Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were an AA couple. She was Kelly, child of the street. She'd been to prison and everything. And I was George, Joe College, you know. I never even got a DUI. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, <laughs> And so we, but the commonality of our of our partnership, our situation, was what made her death so shattering. Although we discussed it, and she died at home with hospice care, which was love. But still, the I mean, it, when I started the um, grief meeting, the therapist said two things: one, no new relationships; two, no new commitments. And three, here's why, because you don't know who you are yet. And that resonated with me as a recovering alcoholic. I got the same advice when I, when I joined AA. Why? Because I really didn't know who I was. I had to learn how to live life without drinking. What the hell is that all about? And I had to learn life uh, without Kelly. It had been my 28 years, a loving relationship full of... Uh, Ups and downs and many discussions, but, <laughs> you know, um, so that that feeling of being at peace with um, a part of the world, the mindfulness, it's when I, uh, there's something um, I hear in a meeting from time to time, um, and I love it, pause and reflect before you take an action and jump off the diving board into an empty pool. Yeah. Pause and reflect. Oh, well, and that, that helps so much. In the middle of a busy day, or when I was, I was Uber driving and Instacarting, which is a busy, busy person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I quit three weeks ago just out of respect to myself and the world. And mm-hmm. I thought, uh, I was always, what do I do? What do I do? It's so conflicting. Wait, stop, pause. Take a breath, refresh yourself. Where are you? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? calm down, you know, pull off the road, the traffic will go away, whatever. And that mindfulness of who I am, where I am now in the present has helped me so, so much. And I saw the topic of today's talk in the meeting. I said, oh, this is just perfect for me. I thought I missed it, but I didn't. Um, California time is just weird. We're Uh. behind the rest of the country. We're always behind (laughs) <laughs> everybody else has been there and gone and we're catching up oh wait a minute yeah. um, so I just love I love the format of the meeting I love all your talks you've had for so many years John you know oh. they've been such a part of my recovery I've looked forward to them I have not deleted a single download oh wow my cell phone is full of them full of them you can go back and review them all oh my um, goodness it's so important <laughs> It's been so important for me to hear about um, group, uh, groups like Smart Recovery, and mm-hmm. there are some in my area. I, I fell asleep yesterday and I missed a Zoom meeting, but I'll be able to catch it next week. There's one in Huntington Beach, oh, yeah. and they're you know they're all over. Yeah, um, back, you have a friend who calls in frequently from Smart. Yeah, and I love to hear him talk. I can't, can't think of his name right now, but this is such a wonderful group, such a wonderful organization. Um, Bobby, I think. I, Bobby. Just, I, I can't tell you, this is so exciting to be able to talk. And I, this is not a speaker meeting, so I'll just shut up. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I really Thank appreciate you, you calling. Thank, Thank you very much. It was really wonderful to hear from you. And gosh, it's just, I don't know oh, what to thank say. You. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Ah, I love you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Isn't that nice? 
That is it blows nice. me away. Um, we love you too, George. <laughs> <laughs> it just blows me away how that um, how this podcast um, makes its way out into the world, and and so many people are listening, and it impacts them, and it is just it's incredible. So really nice to hear from him. Um, Great there's somebody thing to from, be a part of. Yeah, somebody from Baltimore is making a comment. She says that meditation is as generic of a term as sports. There are so many different kinds. Mm-hmm. That's that's my my BFF, Michelle. Oh, is it Michelle? <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. She and I are meditation buddies from way back. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so he was talking about TM, right? Transcendental meditation. Yeah. Um, when Michelle and I first started meditating, we kind of hung out with the Buddhist uh, Theravada Buddhism, which was a, a sect of Buddhism uh, that's uh, the forest tradition, and. Um, and then, yeah, and so that kind of meditation is really about, because it's funny, sometimes when I lead these meditations in groups, you know, I'll say, how was that? And, and you know, some kid will say, wow, man, it was great. I was like out on a boat on the water. <laughs> and I like accept that, but that's not the kind of meditation I'm teaching, right? But, you know, and, the, and that is a kind of meditation though, right? Where you mm-hmm. kind of visualize a happy visualize. place. Yeah. yeah. But the kind of meditation that... Um, that I teach and I aspire to is more of the mindfulness meditation, being aware, uh, the body scans, understanding my body, my thoughts, my feelings. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because um, when you think about it, like we keep talking about, it's not about controlling any of this, not controlling your thoughts or your feelings. And it's like, um, I think, John, you were, when you were talking about the waves of grief, right. Mm. And I feel like um, mindfulness is like, uh, not about controlling the ocean in your mind. It's about learning to surf. Mm, right. I like so, that. Yeah. So the waves are thoughts, feelings, traffic, disappointment, and they will continue, but you can manage these things in a different way with different tools. I like that. Mm-hmm. That that's exactly how it was when I was going through that grief. I, I, Oh man, what a, what a deal that is. That's the most difficult thing for anyone mm-hmm. to go through. And unfortunately there's a lot of that going on right now, but, um, I'm not yeah. down with the surfing. I can do like some other sea metaphor, maybe. But <laughs> I have this thing with sharks, and you know, I've never lived by the ocean, so I don't know why. I think I, you know, my family just let me watch Jaws way too young. But uh, yeah, so the whole surfing thing, just yeah, no, that that doesn't work for me. So we're gonna have to have to do a yacht. Maybe that. Okay. Maybe I, it's just I'm I'm grander. <laughs> that is so funny. Hey, I want to read this little thing. It's it only take me uh, like. T- mm-hmm. Four seconds, but it's um, okay. it's a poem by that famous poet, Anonymous. It, <laughs> it's called Inner Peace. Mm. If you can start the day without caffeine, if you can always be cheerful, ignoring aches and pains, if you can resist complaining and boring people with your troubles, if you can eat the same food every day and be grateful for it, if you can understand when loved ones are too busy to give you time, If you can take criticism and blame without resentment, if you can conquer tension without medical help, if you can relax without liquor, if you can sleep without the aid of drugs, then you are probably the family dog. (laughs) (laughs) So I read that because... This is really just about being human. It's not, uh, it's not a promise to enlightenment. It's not a promise to guru status. You know, right. it's really, you know, the best we're ever going to get is if we can be kind of like more like the family dog, you know, yeah. so um, because I do think, I mean, when I first got sober, it was such a, it was such a wonderful gift, right? I was so happy that I landed in, in, in AA and, but I just kept seeking and that seeking wasn't bad. What was bad was my attachment to the outcome, Mm -hmm. right? So this is going to be the thing, the thing that's going to give me complete peace and serenity. This is going to be the thing that's going to put me in control. And, uh, you know, it took a lot of trial and error to realize that there is no thing you know, the thing is being uncomfortable and allowing myself to not intoxicate my brain when it happens, you know, sitting yeah. through it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Sam likes that poem too. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sam. She's, call back in. <laughs> she says, thank goodness that poem ended that way. I was about to feel very bad about myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah. Well, 
thank you, Jackie. I really appreciate uh, you coming on and having this talk with us. We're coming up on about an hour here pretty soon. Yeah, so yeah. Um, if th- we might have time for another caller, if someone wants to call in, um, we can do that. Um, I did want to spend a minute, just a second, maybe, um, just thanking uh, those of you who have supported AA Beyond Belief financially. It, it means so much to me. Um, occasionally, I would get these uh, emails from our bank that your balance is below $25. And I'm like, oh, man, I got to pay the MailChimp bill. I mean, that that's the way that, that we run this thing. And so um, it's stressful sometimes. And so I put out a little post on the Facebook group, and I was just overwhelmed with the amount of support that I got from you. Uh, people are contributing on Patreon. People started contributing on PayPal. So we went from like having just $16 in the bank to having like $800 in the bank, like in just one day. I was just, I, oh, so wow. thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, because this, you know, I love doing this um, and I would do it if I had to pay for it, I guess, all the time. But it does, you know, um, cost money to do all this stuff. So um, thank you very much. We can keep doing it, <laughs> you know, um, and you can support this podcast easily. Um, you can do it on Patreon, patreon.com. No, yeah. Patreon.com slash AA beyond belief. And even if it's just a dollar a month, that's appreciated and very helpful. And you can also do it through PayPal at, at paypal.me slash AA beyond belief, or just go to the website and I click on the donate button. And I don't want to always talk about asking for money all the time, but thank you. It was just so helpful. You just can't not believe how helpful that was. Um, and thank you uh, very much, Jackie, for, for your presentation on uh, mindfulness and recovery and the power Absolutely. of the pause. Um, this is something that this is an episode I'll, I'll listen to again. Um, I really did like that poem too. That's okay. oh, good. Good. <laughs> good. Well, you know how shy I am. So it was hard to get, get be able to do this, you know, I'll, I'll yeah. try not to call in for a couple of weeks now that I had a whole episode. <laughs> and thank you, Angela, as always, I just love always having you here uh, with me, helping me with, uh, this thing. It's not always easy. Yeah. And, uh, so I thank you so much for that. No problem. I'm here for aesthetics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't see yeah. anyone calling, so I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, oops, that's the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad oh, I'm not in control. See, you're not in control. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> well, that's it. That's another episode of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. I appreciate your support and everything that you do. Um, we'll be back again next Friday for another episode of uh, Sober Distancing. I don't know what we'll be talking about, but it'll be fun and we'll take your calls. Uh, we will also be posting some episodes of Oh, some interviews that I've recorded and have ready to post. So those will be posted this week as well. So until then, you all take care and be well. We'll talk again real soon. Bye-bye.